Good morning, everybody. So we're going to continue along in the midterm three review packet. So if you're looking for where these questions are coming from, they are on the um, lecture slides underneath the chapter nine slides. Uh, we're about halfway through the packet here. Um, so this question here is asking which of the pair, which in each pair is the smallest. And so when we're thinking of size of atoms or ions, we have to think for uncharged atoms, we use our left to right trends. So for calcium versus chlorine, we're thinking our left to right trend is that size when we're uncharged, left to right is decreasing. And the top to bottom, of course, increases. The top to bottom increase, I think, is pretty obvious. But you know, we're just going from 1s to 2s to 3s, so using larger orbitals. Um, and then left to right, we're decreasing because of the effect of charge increasing. So the charge experience by like fluorine is a lot higher, so smaller in terms of lithium being bigger. And so for calcium versus chlorine, we're comparing across calcium uh, and then all the way across um, and actually above, so like if we're comparing where these elements are. So we might compare calcium to, say, magnesium. And so then magnesium is, of course, going to be smaller than calcium. So calcium is bigger than magnesium. And then, of course, magnesium is going to be bigger than chlorine. And so that means that chlorine has to be smaller than calcium. So chlorine is actually a fair bit smaller than calcium. When we're comparing um, ions, we have to think a little bit harder about their size. We don't just use the left or right trend. We might compare their number of electrons. So for sulfide, sulfur has 16 electrons, so S2 minus has 18 electrons. And then scandium neutral would have 21 electrons, so scandium 3 plus also has 18 electrons. And so when our ions are isoelectronic, they have the same electron configuration, we're thinking, OK, you have a 1s2, 2s2, 2p configuration, 3s2, 3p set of orbitals. And then that's all you have, so each of the um, ions has the same electron configuration, it's then a question of which one has more charge. So we have a 16 plus for sulfur, and then we have a 21 plus for scandium. That 21 plus for scandium is going to pull those electrons in more closely. So we have to think when we have the exact same electron configuration, it comes down to proton count. So we got to compare the proton count, more protons, same number of electrons, more protons or pull those electrons in more closely. Um, did a lot of circling prematurely, but that would make scandium here the smallest, smaller than sulfide. So our answer here would be scandium, three plus, and chloride, or chlorine atom. Now, if you kick a charge, like if you, if you go to calcium two plus and chloride ion, we just have to remember chloride goes bigger than chlorine, and then calcium two plus goes smaller, and then we end up inverting their sizes too. So if we're comparing the ions of calcium and chloride that are most common, then we flip back here to these being that same issue of 18 electrons for each, and then a 20 plus versus a 17 plus. So calcium flips to being smaller in its ionic form compared to chloride in its ionic form. Yep. Hold on a second. I'm hitting weird buttons on my iPad. OK, yes. Well, yeah, like if you're comparing calcium 2 plus to strontium 2 plus, then strontium 2 plus is always going to be bigger. So if, if, if you mean if you're comparing 18 electrons to 36 electrons. So in these examples, also, that my statement seems to stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think what you, are, are, you saying, are you saying comparing like fluoride, bromide, iodide, ion? Yeah, so like if, if you're comparing F minus, Cl minus, it's the same like top to bottom trend even with the, the charges. So having charges doesn't flip your top to bottom trend. Well, it's just if they're ions, you have to think about their electrons. And if we, it, the, the only way you can compare if they don't have the same number of electrons, like if you're comparing like fluoride with 10 electrons to sodium or to calcium 2 plus with 18, the calcium is probably going to be bigger. But there's a lot of trends that, you know, when we're giving you the trend, we're going to specifically give you like the same number of electrons to compare that isoelectronic series. Or we're going to give you uncharged to where we use the left or right trends. 
Okay, this question here is actually kind of tricky, I think. So this question here is asking, um, kind of relating back to the photoelectric effect, but that just means a photon of light can carry energy to cause an event to take place, in this case, ionization of an atom. And so it's asking, does the first or second electron of sodium or magnesium require the photon to contain the greatest energy? Um, so it's really just saying which ionization, the first or second of sodium or magnesium requires the greatest energy to be ionized. And so we can write these reactions, like we can write sodium goes to sodium plus plus an electron, um, that's the first, sodium plus loses a second electron to go to sodium two plus. So this is the I2 reaction, this is the I1 reaction for sodium. And the I2 is always greater than I1 for any element, uh, but then I2 is going to be a lot higher than I1 when it's removing a core electron. So as soon as we go to sodium two plus, we're going from a 3S electron being removed to like a 2P electron being removed. And so the I2 for sodium is going to be a lot greater um, than I1. Um, so we saw um, on order of about 10 times higher. When we look at magnesium, we can write magnesium goes to magnesium plus plus an electron. So this would be the I1 for magnesium. The I2 would be magnesium plus losing that second electron. And so if we're comparing these I's, like we can say from what we know about our left to right trend, I ionization energy increases generally left to right. We saw a bit of that periodic increase and decrease like this, where it zigzagged a little bit, where we would have like sodium, magnesium, aluminum lower, and then we'd go across and zigzag to the next two elements, and then our final three elements. We get a little bit of a zigzag effect, and that's just due to removing a higher subshell electron and then removing a spin paired electron in that NP1 and the NP4 configuration. Not really the most important concept to remember, but I think we can understand why we get that zigzagging effect of the ionization energies. So I think we can predict that the I1 of magnesium is gonna be greater than the I1 of sodium. So we can rule out the I1 of sodium because it's definitely going to be of these four ionizations the lowest energy of these four. So that's gonna be the lowest ionization energy and we increase to magnesium. And then the I2 of magnesium, of course, has to be greater than its I1 because the second ionization energy of any substance is greater than its first ionization. So then we can roll out the I1 of magnesium. And then it comes down to a tricky choice between removing a second valence electron versus removing the first core electron. And removing that core electron is just gonna take a lot greater energy due to that electron being a core electron as opposed to a valence electron. So because this is a core electron means that this is the greatest energy of these four. So this requires the greatest energy of these four to be removed, therefore would require the greatest energy photon. So you imagine a photon or some sort of packet of energy hitting these atoms. The second ionization of sodium would take the greater energy of these four. So a tricky question, but just getting us into the thought that our ionizations increase almost doubling, if you will, or close to that, and then going up by about five to 10 times when we start removing a core electron. So core electron removal, a lot greater energy than just removing valence electrons. And so that's what this question is getting at. So this would be the second ionization of sodium. Despite the first ionization of sodium being lower, the second ionization is higher for sodium just because of the core electron removal. Um, sometimes like this problem, like there's a problem in one of the practice quizzes that's like these are the ionization energies for each successive ionization. So sometimes it'll look like one, two, three, and four look like this. And then the fourth ionization was super high. So if we have like a graph of ionization energies, this would be telling us that the fourth electron was a core electron and that these three must have just been valence electrons. And so, like, if we're picking the atom consistent with this ionization energy, it would be the atom with, like, three valence electrons. So maybe something like aluminum might fit this ionization scheme, but not something like, say, carbon, which have four valence electrons, and the fourth would have only been marginally higher than the third. So that's kind of what that topic's getting a question there. Um, let's look at the formal charge and the best Lewis structure of nitrite ion. It's funny, I made a key for these. So there's a key posted underneath, and so some of these questions I feel like I just did, but it's because I did them in my office. But I feel like we did this one in lecture on Monday. But it's an easy enough one to do. All these Lewis structures are really just counting and just making sure we get that minus one for the charge, so not missing the minus one from the charge of NO2. So five for nitrogen, two times six for the O's, plus one 
gives us 18 total electrons. Why this is important is when we single bond the O's to nitrogen, give them an octet, it helps us see if we need lone pairs on nitrogen. So if we don't do this counting process, we might miss when we have assigned 16 electrons by rule so far, the two left over go on to nitrogen. Um, and so then at this point, we'd be looking at nitrogen saying it only has six electrons. It could have eight. Um, it also has a positive charge. So the formal charge here is plus. To make a double bond, we'd want there to be a positive charge to pull those electrons in, and then we'd want there to be a valence for them to go into, especially when this is a second row atom. Or in the second row, we can't expand our octet. So for a second row atom, we're not going beyond eight electrons around the atom. And so I'm gonna make a double bond, and this double bond can resonate with these electrons over to here as well. So we could write another Lewis structure that looks like this one here. So I can write two equivalent yet different Lewis structures. So the real bond of nitrite would be like a three halves bond or a one and one half bond at all times and not a double versus triple or a double versus single. And so then the formal charge of nitrogen here, well, let me make sure that we know how to do this. So the formal charge of nitrogen is really just saying break the bonds in half, keep the lone pairs on nitrogen and just kind of say, well, what would the charge of this atom be if it looked like this? This would just be an ordinary zero charged nitrogen atom because nitrogen should have va uh, five valence electrons for a neutral charge and this atom has five valence electrons. So let's just say neutral charged nitrogen. And so the charge here would be zero. And then let's double check something with um, nitrate for a minute. So if we compare this to nitrate, this here. So if we have NO3 minus, for five plus 18 plus one for 24 electrons. We do our three nitrogens, or, or excuse me, our three oxygens around the nitrogen. That's all 24 of those electrons. So we have no electrons left over, so no lone pair on nitrogen. And so then we can make one double bond. We had, before I made the double bond, a two plus charge. So now I have a plus charge on nitrogen here, so I have a positive formal charge. And then I just wanted to drive home that reminder that we can't expand the octet, like we can't do this again. So we can't make another double bond because that would put 10 electrons around nitrogen. Um, so we can't do that process. We have to remain with this Lewis structure here. And then of course, we can get the resonance over to here and to here so that we could have that electron pair resonating across the three bonds. So we'd have four bonding pairs across three bonds for a four-thirds bond. So oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons. And there's three of them. Yeah, so this is just like three times six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure we, we saw the reminder of why or a molecule that could have expanded its octet to keep reducing formal charge. Like we could reduce the formal charges to go to zero for nitrogen, zero for oxygen with a second double bond, but we just don't have room for those electrons around nitrogen. I'm lost on the math. On the previous one, NO2 minus and the neutral, which of the oxygen is made? Well, the one with the single bond. So anytime you have the single bond, oxygen like this is the minus formal charge. And so then when you have the double bond oxygen, this is the one that would be neutral. Okay, so which atom below releases the most energy upon absorbing an electron? Absorbing electrons is electron affinity. So electron affinity would be something like F plus an electron goes to F minus. Uh, most atoms release energy in this process because absorbing the electron in experiences attraction to the nucleus and then therefore requires energy to be removed. You could think if I take F minus and try to remove the electron, that if this step here requires energy, the F minus to F plus an electron requires energy, then that electron experiences a net attraction to the nucleus. And so this reaction here for F, the electron affinity is about minus 328, I think it is. KJs. So then if you just flip the reaction from like a chapter uh, uh, five perspective, if you flip that chemical reaction, of course you just flip the sign. So here your ionization energy of F minus 
would be equal to plus 328 kJs. And I'm only flipping the reaction so you can see the corollary that if it takes energy to remove an electron, then that electron experiences a net attraction to the nucleus. It has to be broken to remove it. Therefore, the electron affinity being negative means the electron was attracted to the nucleus. Um, and then we're going to be more attracted into the nucleus that has a higher charge that's smaller. So of course, our electron affinities are becoming more negative towards fluorine, towards the halogen group. And so, um, in fact, I probably should be wearing reading glasses. That's actually not an F. That's a phosphorus atom in this problem. But uh, so the uh, so looking at these choices here a bit more closely. So phosphorus, argon, sulfur, chlorine. Chlorine is going to be the most negative because our halogen group is the most negative. Once we get to the noble gases, this resets the trend because there's no room for them to put an extra electron in their valence shell. So you have to pay the extra cost of that higher subshell. And then that means that that electron just isn't attracted into the nucleus in the same way. And therefore, it would just repel back off the atom and, and not stick onto the atom like it does for chloride and other atoms. So most negative towards the halogens, most positive uh, with the noble gases, and then only then positive generally for the atoms that are the NS2 are particularly high because they have to put their electrons into the NP subshell, which is higher in energy. And then the NP3 group isn't as favorable, uh, sometimes not negative, because they have to spin parent electron. There's some energy associated with that. And so these are the opposite of the subshells that had the anomalies for ionization, if you remember. So the NP1 losing electron had the issue of being a little bit lower because of the higher subshell problem. And the NP4 was a little bit lower in ionization because of the spin pairing as well. So we're kind of seeing the opposite trends for um, ionization energy for some breaks in the trend of most negative left to right for electron affinity. So when we think of effective charge, so we can think of like a magnesium atom. So magnesium being a um, 1s2, 2s2, um, 2p6, and then a 3s2 configuration. So you can just think about how you, know, you have the 12 plus charge, the nucleus of magnesium, then you have the 1s, you have the 2s, you have the 2p set of orbitals, and then you have the 3s. And you can start to think, if you're one of these electrons, which one of, of the electrons would experience the greatest charge? And so probably that 1s closest to the nucleus experiences the greatest effective charge. And then the 2s, probably the next most. The 2p might be slightly higher, might be relatively close, because we've said before that the um, electrons in the same shell don't really effectively screen each other from the nuclear charge. So the 2p, probably similar to the 2s, maybe slightly lower charge, because there probably is a little bit of screening, you can imagine, because the 2p are a little bit bigger, so they probably get a little bit of an effect mm -hmm. of that screening from the other electrons. And then the 3s are going to be the lowest. So the lowest screened electrons are the valence or the largest shell orbitals. And so then the 1s is going to experience the greatest effective charge. Um, and so then you can think from, like, if we're comparing magnesium to sodium or something, this just becomes a left to right trend problem of for their valence shell. So if you're talking like sodium versus magnesium, which one experiences the greater charge, our left to right trend for effective charge increases left to right. That's why chloride, fluorine goes smaller than lithium. Um, so we can think left to the outer valence electrons. Um, greatest amount of energy um, to be absorbed to lose an electron. So which atom requires the greatest amount of energy to be absorbed to lose an electron? This is just a tricky way of saying which one has the highest um, ionization energy. And so we're comparing magnesium, calcium, oxygen, and then sulfur. And so then we're comparing these uh, charges, we know the ionization energy is generally increasing left to right. These are chosen to be far away from each other, so we don't have to worry about that goofy anomaly for atoms that are like right next to each other. Like if we wanted to compare to you know the, the phosphorus and whatever's below phosphorus, the arsenic, that if we're comparing these atoms here, we might have a tricky time due to that anomaly, but we're choosing atoms that are far away so we can use our general trend that ionization energy is increasing um, towards from left to right. So ionization energy increases left to right due to that in, uh, decrease in size. For ionization energy? Well, ionization energy left to right, um, helium is higher. So from left to right, hydrogen to helium, you would still have that trend. 
and then from top to bottom, the trend is uh, decreasing. So I think this arrow here, I was, I was thinking of it increasing left to right, not necessarily towards fluorine. So the top to bottom trend is that slight decrease. So top to bottom, I think the way I wrote that arrow was confusing. So maybe that's what led to this question. Top to bottom, we get the decrease in ionization energy. And hydrogen's very high. And then the other um, metals below it are, are much lower. Um, so that definitely continues that trend. But hydrogen to like lithium to, to, to sodium, it's like 1,300 or something for hydrogen, 500 for lithium. So a big drop there. But then it's like 495 for sodium. So anyways, general decrease from top to bottom. So what this is going to mean is that magnesium is going to be, wrong way, magnesium is going to be greater in ionization than calcium following the top to bottom trend. The oxygen should be greater than sulfur from top to bottom because we get that decrease. And then if we're comparing magnesium across the S in the same group, that magnesium is definitely lower than sulfur in terms of ionization energy because we get the increase from left to right. And so then we know magnesium is lower than sulfur. Then we know oxygen has to be the greatest. So oxygen here is going to require the greatest energy to be ionized. So this equation here. This is an interesting topic here because this came from chapter five as well where we were looking at our delta H of reactions approximately equal to the sum, that's not sum, to the sum of the bond strengths of the reactants. This is that weird one that was reactants minus the products. But this just comes about from like a Hess's law kind of picture. If you take the energy to go from your reactants to fragments, and then you take the energy to go from fragments to products that you're just taking, the energy it takes to break the bonds in the positive direction. So it takes energy to break those bonds. And then when you need to flip the fragments making the, the products, that's then flipping the bond strength problem. So that's then subtracting the bond strengths of the products. And then here in chapter, um, once we see chapter eight, we can go through and sketch Lewis structures. In chapter five, we'd have to show you Lewis structures. These molecules aren't particularly tricky though to see that we just have chlorine with a single bond. We have three fluorines. I'll just go ahead and sketch out three. And then these are going to two ClF3s. Now ClF3, we'd have seven valence electrons for each of those atoms times four. So that's 28 total valence electrons. So in terms of a Lewis structure, we're going to have Cl, three fluorines single bonded with an octet and that's 24 electrons. And so we have four left over. Electrons that go on to chlorine, just as lone pairs. And so we have three single bonds between F and Cl and ClF3. And I'm gonna sketch the second one just to have the two products kind of shown. So I have one Cl2, three F2s, and two ClF3s. And so then all I have to do here is kind of say, well, how much energy does it take to break these bonds? And so that's going to be 155 times 3 for the, the fluorines. It's going to be 155 and then plus 242 to break the chlorine-chlorine bond. So that's 707 kJs to break those bonds. So 707 kJs, and then we go to two Cl atoms plus six F atoms as a result. So it takes energy to break those bonds. And then we combine these atoms to then go to the two ClF3s and say, well, how much energy do we get back when we then form those new bonds? So then I need to subtract the bond strengths of my uh, products. And so I have six ClF bonds. So I need to do six times 253, because the 253 kJs per mole is the CLF bond strength. So that's 15, 18 kJs. So I get back 1,518 kilojoules when I make the new bonds. So to break six CLF bonds would take 15, 18 kJs to form six CLF bonds, I get back 1518 kJs. So we do 707 minus 1518, and that's minus 811. 
So a similar problem that we had seen before in chapter five, again, it's in chapter eight, but the only difference is we can look at structures and sketch their Lewis structures and not have to be given them like we did in chapter five. CLF. There's uh, so I'm just looking at the balancing of the reaction. So there's two CLF threes, three F twos. So CL CL two. So 155 times three for the three F twos plus 242 for the chlorine. Well, like we're, so we're taking the reactants, breaking their bonds, and then forming the product bonds. So you can think one times the CLCL plus three times the FF, and then minus the six times the CLF. Yeah. And then that goes to minus A11. Okay, so this question here is asking us to identify. Yeah. All right, so the next few questions are on MO theory, probably a good thing to spend a good, you know, solid chunk of time on to make sure we're on the same page with some of these problems here. One of the first questions here is to identify this orbital. Um, let me ask you guys real quick, kind of easy enough question to ask real quick for you to think about it for a couple seconds. You think it's sigma, sigma star, pi, or pi star? Who thinks it's a sigma? Who thinks it's sigma star? Okay, good. It is a sigma star. And like this is like, sometimes this question seems trickier than maybe what it is. You're just looking for um, the, the stars when breaking a bond, the, the bonding orbital without the stars when bringing the orbital together. So, and this would actually be like a sigma sort of, maybe like a sigma 1s orbital. We can tell those are 1s orbitals too, not even 1p orbitals. Like a sigma 1p or a sigma 2p orbital for like something like O2, like we'd have what looks like p orbitals that are going to be on the axis of the molecule of that bond. And then we're going to have the shape that kind of looks like the bond being broken. So the sigma 2p is gonna look more like this here where we have the electron being further away. So the greater probability is away from the nuclei. So this would be like a sigma 2p star versus a sigma 2p, the bonding orbital, would look kind of like the same thing. Think about the 2p orbitals, but the, the electron being most probably located between the nuclei. So that would look more like this. So we have the greater probability between the nuclei. Um, and so then you can connect this here too. So this might look like, in some structures, you could write this as something that looks more like, like that, where it's, maybe that's not even sketched, where it's more symmetrical, um, showing that the sort of effect of those two orbitals mixing together. Then the p orbitals, you get the bonding when we get the orbital between the nuclei. And then so sometimes this might look like where we can sketch this kind of like our nuclei are here, and then we have the probability of finding the electron above and below the bond. And so that's why we get this planar bond, so that's our pi bond. I don't like that box, I'm gonna do the box. So this would be one of our pi orbitals. This would be a pi 2p bonding orbital. And then the anti-bonding orbital would be breaking the bond, so these orbitals would be moving away, kind of look like a butterfly almost. And so that's moving the orbitals away from each other. So that'd be a pi 2p star. And then the only one I guess we didn't kind of sketch out here is what the sigma like 1s or 2s orbital looks like. So the bonding orbital, the, this one here being the sigma star, the bonding orbital of course just looks like the s electrons overlapping. And then we don't see that second set of lobes to indicate like a p orbital. So we don't see like a second lobe pointing away that looks like a p orbital. So you should be able to like look at an orbital and kind of see is it s orbitals or is it p orbitals involved? And then are they on the axis together, that's a sigma, or are they planar relative to each other, those are the pi bonds. Okay, so oops. I'm gonna go through kind of what some of the orbitals look like. And we can think about what orbitals look like for these larger 
uh, diatomic molecules too. So when we're thinking of um, something like O2 minus. So O2 minus, we need to go to the right diagram. So the only difference between these diagrams are these two set of orbitals here. So in O2, F2, neon 2, the sigma 2p is lower in energy than the pi 2p set of orbitals. And then in V2, C2, N2, it flips. So that's the only difference between the two set of diagrams. We give this to you on test because it seems silly to memorize that or to have known that. I don't think you could have predicted that fact. Um, but for O2, we'd just be thinking with a minus charge, 2 times 6 plus 1, 13 electrons in. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and then 13. So we're just applying Hund's rule, putting electrons in in order. The hidden axis here is energy, so energy high to low, just like any other configuration. And then if we want to fill our diagram in, these are the two s orbitals. The idea here is you have like your two oxygen atoms on the outside, and you're just sort of approaching, or thinking of the atoms approaching each other. And so each oxygen atom has the 2s, 2p orbital, another 2p orbital, and the other atom has the same set of orbitals neglecting the p orbital sticking straight out of the page. And so then you can sort of start to see we get our sigma 2p, our sigma s orbitals, our pi orbitals, and then the anti-bonding contributions from those two. So we get our sigma 2s, our sigma star 2s, then we get our sigma 2p. The sigma 2p, we know it's the 2p because it's coming from the 2p set of atomic orbitals. Um, so the, the sort of orbital that comes down comes from the 2p set, so that's why we know that's a sigma 2p. And then we go pi 2p next, pi star 2p, and then sigma star 2p. And then the last thing is, or the last thing to point out is, the pi is given away by 2 because the p orbital I didn't draw is another, another pi orbital. So the one sticking straight out of the page would also be a pi. And so we might think of this one, that that pi bond, we get two of them. And the sigma, we just get one. And then, I mean, I keep saying maybe the last thing, but there's a lot of things to consider. The other thing that you can't just do, sometimes you might think, well, why don't we just take the p orbitals here and just put them up here or put them down here? And you can't move an orbital. I mean, like, there's electrons spinning around the nucleus. They have to be centered around the nucleus. That's the whole point of the orbital. So we have these orbitals here. And, well, like, hi, uh, hybrid orbital theory, they can mix and change their pointing, but we can't just take an orbital and fundamentally move it somewhere else. So you might be thinking, why don't we just get sigma overlap by moving these orbitals around? Because we can't do that. So we get our pi bonds, we get our sigma bonds um, in the MO diagram. So some of the questions we ask are things like, is this ion paramagnetic? Diamagnetic is all spin paired. Paramagnetic has an unpaired electron. So this molecule here is paramagnetic. That means it would be drawn into a magnetic field. Something that's diamagnetic is actually weakly repelled by a magnetic field. I think it's just easier to say it just isn't drawn into the magnetic field. Um, and then the other thing we can do is calculate a bond order. Our bond order is one half the bonding minus the star anti-bonding electrons. And so the bond order is like the net pairs of bonding electrons. And so this would be one half. We have eight bonding electrons. How do we know this? Well, we have these two bond, bonding electrons and then these six. And then the blue ones here are the anti-bonding electrons. So the sigma star 2s and the pi star 2p have five electrons. So the bond order here would be three halves. Now, like, I, I don't think we ask too many questions like this, but I think it's an interesting task to say, well, how would you sketch an, um, like a, a, a Lewis structure consistent with this bond order. And for O2, it would look something like this, so that we'd have our three halves bond, so three halves bonding electrons. And then from there, we'd have those electrons that were lone pairs that were canceled out. But, so, so the lone pairs are the effect of bonding versus non-bonding electrons that had canceled each other out. And so two, four, six, eight, 10, um, and then we need the one more electron. And so then when you start to think of like your pairing of electrons, you can start to think a little bit about how maybe you can sketch a Lewis structure that can show some unpaired electrons 
in the Lewis structure that we're missing when we just were just generically thinking of like O2. Remember how like O2, we would just sketch it like this and have a hard time predicting that it had unpaired electrons. So we can try to maybe sketch a Lewis structure. The only reason I like to think of this one here is if you think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is that within this Lewis structure, each atom actually satisfies the octet rule. Remember how like in Lewis structures in like chapter eight, we were talking about how if you have an odd electron count, one of the atoms has to violate the octet rule. Well, in the MO diagram, you can see, no, the molecule's actually smarter than the octet rule or smarter than our Lewis structure was. It said, let's actually have a fractional bond order so that each atom actually gets its octet. Um, and so this is what O2 with a minus charge would look like in terms of its MO diagram. Uh, a couple other MO questions. This one here is asking for which molecule is diamagnetic. So again, diamagnetic is which one has, means it has zero unpaired electrons. And so we know O2 is paramagnetic, and that's <clears throat> why we did this whole lesson. And we could just double check. So to double check would just be coming over here for O2, 12 electrons, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12 electrons. And so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons. 2 unpaired means that this is paramagnetic. Now, again, if you would, are in tune with the reason why we went through MO theory, I think was to understand this property of oxygen that we would have gotten wrong with all of our other bonding models, and you probably would know it without even necessarily doing the diagram. B2 is the one we might do next. So for B2, we go 2, 4, six electrons. So for B2, we only have six valence electrons, three for each. So that's why we have six electrons. And then because the pi is next, it gets those two electrons spin paired. So B2 is only a single bond. If we're asked for the bond order here in B2, the bond order is just one for four minus two, four bonding minus two anti-bonding electrons. And then, uh, uh, so a single bond, but it's a weird single bond where the, the electrons are actually in pi bonds. So it's a single bond with two electrons in two different pi bonds. Very weird structure. But it's also paramagnetic, not diamagnetic. And then C2, we put two more electrons in for C2. Then we get the spin paired electrons. So diamagnetic for C2. So MO theory, kind of complicated in terms of how the diagrams look and how the orbitals look and all that, but how you practically put electrons in and answer questions, it's usually things that are calculating bond orders. Um, what's the magnetic property based on paired versus unpaired electrons? And then the question you sometimes see is one like this that asks us to rank some bond lengths that we get from the MO diagram. And then this question here just comes back to some bond length trends, maybe a little bit out of chapter seven of, um, Let's look at B2 and F2 first. Like we just saw before, so B2 was this, that B2 has a bond order of one. Let's actually do the bond order over here. So we saw the bond order was one, four minus two times a half for B2. For F2, we'd have seven times two, 14 electrons. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. So 14 electrons in for F2. Now what's the bond order of F2? Well, we have the bonding electrons again, so eight bonding electrons, and then minus two plus four, so we have six anti-bonding electrons. So our bond order is also one, which makes sense for F2 because F2 is just like we thought it was before. It was just a single bond. And so then the bonding versus anti-bonding leads to these lone pairs. So lone pairs are just like the average of bonding versus anti-bonding. And so our net bond order is a single bond for F2. So we also get a bond order of one for F2. Now F2 versus B2 comes down to then, they both have single bonds. And so then the longer bond is going to be the one with the bigger atom. So you just think, is boron bigger or is fluorine bigger with a neutral charge? So just atomic trends. So the atomic trend of boron is that boron's bigger than F2. So B2 is going to have a longer bond than F2. So both of them are single. Then it comes down to atomic radii trends. 
So we're just comparing the atomic radius of B versus F. Um, and so then for O2 versus C2, for C2, we saw that C2 was the uh, double bond now with oddly two pi bonds. But for C2, the bond order would be two. So the bond order here is one half, six bonding, two antibonding. So that's how we get the bond order of two for C2. And then those net bonds are just those two pi bonds. So C2 is a very weird structure. You might sketch it something like this from the Lewis structure, where you get that double bond. Um, but where the double bond is the net two pi bonds. So like, you know how um, in hybrid orbital theory, we would look at a sketch for a molecule where you have like H, C, double bond O, C, you know, triple bond C to H. You know where we're looking at this thing. This is a sigma plus a pi. This is like a sigma plus two pi. These are sigmas. And so we could count up that this molecule would have one, two, three, four, five sigmas, and then one, two, three pi bonds. So we could count up the number of like sigma and pi bonds in a molecule. That for C2, we, we might look and say, well, that's a double bond. That's a sigma and a pi. It's oddly something we could sketch as just having two pi bonds. Probably not a question we'd ever ask. But from the MO diagram, you can see the net bond is actually two pi bonds. And so you get some interesting kind of like features you can get out of an MO diagram that you don't get out of these other bonding models. Um, but what we see for C2, like O2, so if we kick two electrons off of F2 to go to O2, we probably remember O2 has a double bond too, that oxygen has that double bond. And so then O2 and C2 have the same kind of problem like B2 and F2, of both being double. And so then we can compare for O2 and, B2, uh, O2 and C2 and say, well, left to right, oxygen's smaller, so O2 double is going to be shorter than C2 double. And so then we can predict here that O2 should be shorter than C2, just from atomic radii trends and the fact that they're both double. Okay, and so then we're looking for the longest bond. And so our single bonds are always longer than double in the same row as each other. So like F2, longer bond single than O2 double, <coughs> O2 double longer than N2 triple. So we don't even, don't even have to think about anything other than the fact they're in the same row as each other, single longer than double, longer than triple. And so what that means is then that the B2 and F2 are going to be longer in length than C2 and O2. So our trend is going to go B2 longest, F2 next, and then our C2 double next, and then O2 as the shortest. So if we wanted to rank all four, we could come up with this ranking here. In fact, when we had went through MO theory, we came up with this prediction previously in class. We went back and looked at like a picture that showed us the bond links and saw that we got this trend exactly, that we got the trend that we expected. And so B2 here is going to be the longest of these four. Uh, so tricky question in that, you know, we're using the MO diagram to get the better picture of the bond order. So the reason why we, we might use the MO theory here is that for C2, if you use a Lewis structure, you might have said, well, is it quadruple? Because like a Lewis structure that satisfies the octet rule for carbon would have been a quadruple bond. Well, you can see that there's really no way to get a quadruple bond from MO theory and the MO theory is consistent with the experimental data for these bond lengths, so MO theory is a much better model at predicting these bond lengths. So sometimes on a test question, you might see, you know, according to MO theory, you know, determine the bond orders and then rank the molecules in order of bond length or predict which one's shorter or longer. That's how we would do it with an MO theory. Okay. So that was sort of the packet of problems. The, um, I uh, so it, uh, on my daily quizzes, there's like a couple chapter eight reviews. It's like the second one in the packet. But there was a question on this packet, a couple on um, quizzes on the board here. Let me hover process that I do one problem I thought you guys might want to see another example of. Um, and so I know last time I think we had left hanging the possibility of doing another question on this topic here. And so question 33 here is asking, you know, with the blow information, um, along with Hess's law, can we calculate the lattice energy of magnesium chloride? Um, and so then we can look at the choices here. Now, when I wrote this question like a long time ago, I actually wrote this question that if you were savvy enough that you wouldn't even have to do the calculation. 
Does anybody know what the answer is without even doing the calculation? Does anybody have a guess? Like, um, does anybody think it's D? I don't know, there's no easy way to ask this. If I could pull, it might be easier. Anybody think it's D? Because it's actually D without even doing the calculation. You might say, how do we know this? Well, the reason why you know it is if you just know that the, like the plus one, minus ones are about 800 kJs per mole, the plus two, minus ones are about 2,000 or so kJs per mole, and the plus two, minus twos are about quadruple or so, the plus two, minus twos are about four times the 800 of the plus one, minus ones, so they're like three to 4,000. So just the range really means that the, the value is going to have to be like 2,500. So you can kind of ballpark the, the estimation of, of um, lattice energies just from what you know about other molecules' lattice energies. But then the other thing that you can see or that you can do is just try to use Hess's law, if you ever have to do a problem like this, is just to try to write out the reactions for these guys here in some sort of a way that allows you to sum them up to get the overall reaction of MgCl2 goes to Mg2 plus gaseous molecule plus 2Cl minus gaseous. Like we're just trying to use Hess's law. And so then what we might then do is say, okay, how do we get this reaction here is by, well, let's just start with the first thing we need. You know what I mean? Like let's just start with MgCl2 solid goes to its elements, magnesium solid and Cl2. And then magnesium solid has to go to the gaseous atom to start ionizing it. The gaseous atom has to go to a plus and then lose the electron. The magnesium plus gas has to go to Mg2 plus gas plus another electron. Cl atom has to absorb the electron, so I got to go from Cl2 to Cl atom. And then chlorine, two of them, have to absorb the two electrons given off by magnesium to form 2Cl minus. And so then it seems like a lot of reactions, but if you notice, I'm just going from MgCl2 to its elements in their standard state, then I'm going to their gaseous form of free atoms, and then we're ionizing to plus for magnesium, to two plus then, and then to minus for chloride. And so then for each of these steps, then the question kind of becomes, do we know the energy of those steps from the information that was provided? Or like, how do we know it from the information that was provided? Um, and so then the first reaction is just the flipping of the delta HF of magnesium chloride. So it's the negative of this here. So this is plus, so our delta H for this reaction is plus 642. That's positive because I flipped the formation reaction. Formation forms the product. Here we flipped the reaction where that product's a reactant. So that's why I flipped the sign. Magnesium solid to gas is the delta HF of the gaseous atom. And so the delta HF of magnesium gas, 147. I haven't flipped that reaction. The gaseous substance is the product as it should be to use the number as is without flipping the sign. Then I'm ionizing magnesium first and second ionization. So 738 kJs, 1451 kJs. And then here we have um, the bond strength of Cl2. So chlorine bond breaking to two Cl's. The delta H here would be plus 243 from what we know about bond strengths. We could also be given the delta HF of chlorine. And then we have the last reaction is two times the ionization energy or the uh, electron affinity of chlorine. So we're given the electron affinity of chlorine, minus 349. So two times minus 349. So we're keeping the same sign because we're just ionizing the, the, the chlorine to Cl minus, absorbing those two electrons in. We're just doing it twice. So if we do all this math, we're going to get answer D. Okay, so we may have known it, like if we're savvy enough, we could double check it if we want to. We can see Hess's law. But like, you know, the, the idea here is just everything's canceling, you know, and like that's kind of neat to see that, that you can use Hess's law in this way. If you notice, everything's canceling except 
MgCl2 goes to Mg2 plus, and then 2Cl minus. And so it's just like a lesson in futility of seeing how a bunch of reactions that we know the delta H of previously from other experiments can be summed up to get this reaction to delta H. And then the, the idea is that this lattice energy tells us something. It tells us how attracted those ions were together by figuring out how much energy it would take to separate them. And so then the lattice energy trends again, if you increase the charge magnitude, so you go to from plus one minus one to plus two minus two, you increase the lattice energy. You put the ions closer together, make them smaller, you increase the lattice energy as well. Okay, so we got about five minutes left. Any particular problems, like any topics? I understand the calculations, but you get to be doing it. You get what? I understand the calculations, but without doing the calculation, you get to that D. What yeah. the reason for getting to that D? Well, it's just if you literally just add them up. I mean, I just don't want to take the time to spend a minute on it adding them up. But like if you want to like add them up, then you should get answer D, is what I'm saying. Right, right. Yeah. I get that. Oh, oh, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's if you knew the ballpark, it's like if you know bond strengths, then you would know it's about 2,500. Like, I, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. So like, if, if you had remembered plus one minus ones are 800, and plus two minus twos are like three to 4,000, then the plus two minus ones would be right in the middle. So if you notice the choices, it's like we had 600, 4,000, 2,500. 2,500 is the only one that kind of makes sense. I saw a hand up here as a particular question or topic that we could talk about for a couple minutes before we leave. Maybe they've given up and want to leave. I don't. Okay, so midterm threes. Oh, there is a hand over here. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, there's a reason why I didn't maybe cover that. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, ask me after class. I'll explain. OK. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the only thing I would think about dipole moment is you know, the greater the difference in electronegativity, the greater the polarity, then the greater the formal charges, the greater the polarity. Um, so, so more ranking trends is what I think more about dipole moments and specifically calculating charges. Okay. Any last hands before we depart? All right, good luck tonight. Um, we'll see you back here Friday. And seven lectures to go. <laughs> Um, for this one, I suspect. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there was one problem on one of these quizzes. These are like the chapter.